And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us straight from Alligator Alley Entertainment. A, ma a man who, a man of many talents, up to and including the creation of Esper Genesis, as well as being an Emmy Award winner and honoree for the Diana Jones Award, and now, th and now, crowdfunding expedition from the mysterious peaks. I understood that reference. The one and only Rich Lesko Flair. How you doing tonight, man? I'm doing pretty good. How are you? I'm doing good. Um. The ch the change in season means that means that it means that once it gets dark around here, it gets pitch black. But <laughs> but I'm good. For me, I'm I'm in Florida, so it's kind of more of the same. I'm in I'm in Minnesota, so it is. Well, technically, is more of the same, but not in the same regard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're like dark by what four thirty. Five. Okay, bad enough. And, and of course, of course, the temperature is starting to go down. So everybody's, everybody's starting to, everybody's starting to wear their heavy coats except me. All I need is just a sweater. Oh, look at you! I kind of miss the cold weather. I'm, I'm still not used to uh, there being no winter here. Weird. Now, it's a bit of a tradition to open with the humble beginnings. And with that in mind, I'd like to I'd like you to walk me through your how you first got introduced to role playing and what made it stick. Basically, your RPG origin story. Uh playing or or creating <laughs> is the question, I guess. Let's go with the first and then the second. All right. Uh, well, playing. Uh, I have told this couple. I have told the story a couple times. I was uh way. <laughs> <laughs> Very long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away. No, no. It's, it's hey, not let's not get ourselves. So, let's not get <laughs> going to get us sued. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, yes, yes. Uh, well, it's definitely a long time ago. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Uh, I was in lunch line in school, and uh, don't worry, this will be a story, but it, you know, it, it'll go somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, the kid behind me decided to be kind of funny and reached over my shoulder and flicked a kid in front of me in the ear. And uh, that kid turned around, immediately assumed it was me, punched me in the face. And the two of us went at it, and uh, we were both in trouble. We did not get to participate in, uh, in phys ed the next um, period, so we were confined to the bleachers. Uh, I was sitting over him, you know, I kind of explained, hey, it wasn't me, you know, he didn't seem to care. And he went into his bag and opened up and uh, opened up his bag and pulled out the um, the uh, OD&D uh, basic set mm -hmm. and was going through it. And I looked and I saw pictures of like, I saw a cool picture of, of like, you know, a, a person in armor and a dragon. And I saw all this stuff and like, you know, I was already into, you know, choose your own adventure books and uh, all that stuff. So I just kind of looked and said, hey, man, uh, what are you looking at? What is that? I haven't seen that before. And he turned around with this look of amazement, like, wait, are you talking to me about my thing that I'm looking at? And got really excited and started explaining everything to me and uh, brought the books to my house later on. And I read them all. And, you know, that's kind of how I got started. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm in. Yeah. So, so I owe it all to that jerk kid that was behind me that decided to crack a joke. <laughs> Now, on the now on the other hand, there's the pl there's the play not the player but the designing end of things. How did that get started? Uh, well, I love to do story writing. I was originally writing uh, short stories and submitting them to TSR when they were a thing uh, at the time. And uh, when I was I, I was writing a, a novel that kind of sat on the sidelines for too long 
And eventually I started turning it into uh, an adventure. I started doing a little bit of graphic design work on the side. And uh, once 5th edition had, had come out, I started enjoying D&D again and decided to take the stories that I was writing and turn them into 5th edition modules. Uh-huh. And, you know, I even started copying, like, you know, the trade dress and stuff like that just to make it look cool, just so I could bring it to, uh, you know, my, my friend's... Uh, uh, um, my friend's business, uh, my friend Brian, who had uh, he, he had uh, passed away earlier this year, uh, but uh, he was really pushing me forward to actually, you know, start doing some work in the industry. Mm-hmm. So he had brought me to the um, to the Gamma Trade Show in uh, 2016. Is it 2016? Oh, wow. Okay, 2016. Mm-hmm. And the Wizards team was there, <laughs> and they were uh, they were just going on about all the new stuff that was coming out for, for D and D and eventually it ended and I just kind of got up. I had my iPad. I'm like, you know what the hell with it? I'm going to go talk to these guys. Mm-hmm. And so I, I went up there, spoke to them for a little while and they were very receptive. And, and one of them asked me, said, Hey, are you know, I, I see you have some stuff here. Are you interested in writing for, for, uh, you know, any setting D and D? And I said, Yeah. <laughs> sure, you know, I just kind of agreed, okay, this is a thing. And a few weeks later, I got an email to write uh, my first Adventures League adventure, which was in Volo's Wake. I wrote that with uh, Sean Merwin and Monica Malinelli. And from then on, you know, when I went to cons, it was uh, getting to, you know, getting to know people and, you know, finding out what was going on in in the in the industry. I met a, lot, met a whole lot of other industry people while I was continuing to write for D&D Adventures League. And that just kind of opened up a lot of doors, you know, uh, until the point where we decided, hey, we can publish our own thing. Mm -hmm. And that brings me to to one of the um, one of the key one of the key things with with this particular this particular bit of shenanigans, that being Esper Genesis. How did the obvious obviously um, Going into the details of it is is a story in and of itself, but how did Esper Genesis get off the ground? Uh, it started as a, a set of of weapons and armor and gear for for a five E mm-hmm. that I was gonna put I was gonna put up on DM's Guild because I love sci fi as much as I love you know fantasy. They they kind of go hand in hand mm-hmm. uh, for me. I I was a uh, you know, you're like a fantasy star fan when you're a kid, right? That's just kind of like both in the that's like both in the perfect sandwich kind of thing. So <laughs> I'll give you props for so, a fantasy star. Yep, yep. <laughs> uh, so I I put together this thing, and you know, Eric, with uh, my other my, my other business partner in Alligator Alley, he he looked at it and he said, "This looks great, Rich. Um, what are you gonna do with it? Like, who's gonna use this?" And I sat there and I looked at it and I was like, you're right. No one needs this crap. <laughs> like, you know, how are you going to stick this in anything? So I said, well, I guess I need, you know, stories that, that, that could actually use this stuff. Hey, I need some characters. Hey, you know what? You know, this, this, I, I, need a, I need a setting. And, you know, that started growing. That setting needed characters. Mm-hmm. Those characters needed concepts. You know, it needed, you know, aliens. And so it... it, it just blew up into I, I started just putting a whole bunch of notes together and I said, you know what, I'm actually gonna make this into a sci fi game using the using the D and D rules. Yeah. Um well I I had uh I had given it to um well actually Ken Height, I th- he he had he had come down uh he was on vacation and he was looking through it. And the he asked me the one more most important question that that I got, which was, okay, Rich, you did this now. Why would I play this instead of playing D and D, or why would I play this when I already play D and D? So I said, okay, you know, he's right. Uh, which is why when we actually started putting together the 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 big rules for Espergenesis, we wanted to do two things. Uh, we wanted to make it more 
um, more versatile for, for a game master to tell a story versus just mechanics. The mechanics were going to be 5e no matter what we do, but they but they could be like 5e mechanics that feel like D&D, but you know they're not because they have that, you know, all of them have that that kind of sci-fi, like, you know, Final Fantasy, Mass effect feel to it. Like, that's what we were looking for and make it easy to use but make it so versatile that anybody that actually that's actually like a sci-fi fan or wants to make something sci-fi can create a sci-fi setting can create a, fi- a sci-fi story out of the basic setting just kind of how like like how D is D has a base fantasy setting so we were like well we want to give a base sci-fi setting that gms can grow a galaxy from and we wanted to make the sci-fi rules um very plug and play because sci-fi has in my opinion, a lot more uh, it's the variations between the different types of sci-fi uh, it varies broadly compared to different types of fantasy. I mean, there are a lot of types of fantasy, but I mean, sci-fi is kind of everywhere. <laughs> so yeah. we, we wanted to make it, yeah, we wanted to make it so that like, you know, yeah, you want to play this type of sci-fi? It's possible. You want to play that type of sci-fi? That's nothing like it. You know what? That's possible too. Mm-hmm. Oh, which is which is saying something because when, whenever somebody says that they want to do a fantasy RPG or they want to do a sci-fi RPG, I'm like, okay, which one? <laughs> yep. Like, what, like some on one of the Facebook groups that I'm on, somebody asked somebody asked about what um, what sci-fi TTRPGs would they recommend? I'm like, well, first off, you need you need me you need to give me something with a little more meat on the bones because there's because there's so many things that could qualify as as science fiction. That that I, that I could go all over the place, and I and I probably still it probably still not be exactly what you're looking for. So, gotta give me something. Yep. Yeah. It, is it? Is it? Uh, you know? Is it sci horror? Is it sci fantasy? Is it space opera? Is it you know tech noir? Is it um, you know cyberpunk or steampunk or <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's, yeah. Even, we we wanted. Just... Uh, even just give me, giving me um giving me franchises that you, that it's li- that it's like is a ste- is yep. a step in that direction is a step in the right direction. The same thing goes with fantasy. I'd say um I'd say I'd I'd say the I'd say the whole one size fits all attitude has even bigger offenders with fantasy. <laughs> oh. Uh fantasy fantasy has its um fantasy has its tropes though. Uh, it, it it's it's it certainly uh, it certainly does, but um, um, I I mainly do that because I I like I like giving people crap who um ha- who have the idea that um fantasy has to be, has to be has to be that Tolkien pastiche. Oh no, definitely not. Oh, that's not to say you yeah. can't do that, but there's no re- but that doesn't mean that you should. And yeah, I've told the story before, but I rem- I remember he- I remember hearing about how I remember hearing. Um, in f- and looking at in old forums where people had said that Planescape, for instance, was too weird to be fantasy. Which uh, is... no, it's 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 fa- it's it's fantasy just fine. There's there is a you could quantify it as sci-fi in a way, but something like Planescape you know, it, it, um is is straddles the line just out of sheer weirdness. So you yeah. could make you could make an argument one way or the other. Yes, agreed. And that brings me to Expedition from the Mysterious Peaks. Because um first off, as I mentioned at the top, I don't think don't think that little reference didn't slip by me. <laughs> I know exactly <laughs> where where you got that title. <laughs> that's ex- every, every, that's the reason why I named it that actually. It's it's literally for people to recognize it and go, "Oh, I think I know where this is going." Yeah. Now, grant now granted the co- now granted the cover art certainly helps, but at the time I just at the time I just had the title, and and then I and then I looked at what was going on. And I'm like, okay, I see I see where this is going. Um, and give, given the given the fact that you mentioned that your partner had asked had asked the question of why would I run this if um if I already have D if I already have D and D, was Expedition from the Mysterious Peaks born of the answer to that question? Uh, no, not entirely. Uh, it, it, 
what was born from the answer to that question is what led to expeditions from the Spirit's Peaks. So from the from the Spirit's Peaks. So you are partially correct. Um, yeah, we what what we did out of uh, to answer that question actually was when we came out with our with our third rule book, we created it so that you can um, you can create any kind of sci-fi, mm-hmm. and you can play and you can play it with any five e book. Any five E book, you can you can really plug and play and uh, and make it work. So so yes, in a, in a, in a way that's um, that's kind of the the goal that we had in mind. We we wanted to we wanted to make a game that you could play and it would be universal and it would be versatile and you could take like you know the official D and D books or take you know whatever five E supplement just as long as they didn't. Uh, completely, <laughs> completely revamp the 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 basic uh, core tenet of the rules, and plug it into Esper Genesis, and it'll work. Uh, Expedition from the Mysterious Peaks was kind of a a springboard off of that. The reason being, Barrier Peaks was one of the most memorable modules uh, that I played when I first started playing D anD D because it had everything that I love in it. You know, mind you, the you know the, the the sci-fi back then was very like you know saucer and and like you know round metal devices and sort of heavy metally kind of thing, <laughs> but but I still you know I still I enjoyed the crap out of it. And when it was being written, it was being written uh, at the time to bridge D and D into Metamorphosis Alpha hmm. back in uh, back in 1980 when it was coming out. So uh, I I looked at that and um, I was kind of looking through old <laughs> old mods that I had and and as I said I said well this is really cool I always wanted to kind of continue a campaign based off of this when I had played it the first time but you know we we were we were playing everything back then so that just kind you know that fell by the wayside. And I said, well, we have a sci-fi game now that we just finished. So why don't I, why, why don't I just do the same thing? Uh, Barrier Peaks was written to spring into Metamorphosis Alpha. Why don't I create something, not really redoing Barrier Peaks, but using it as a springboard and write like a campaign sequel story, like a big saga that incorporates... Uh, D and D or or Fantasy Five E, I should say, mm-hmm. and Esper Genesis, and and build that bridge again, that same thing, but and then this time make it so that you could play it with either sets of rules or both. Mm-hmm. Now, I remember do, I remember a long time ago I tried to do I tried to do something not far off where I tried to do a unified world using Legend of the Five Rings and Seventh C, which was a logistical nightmare. Um, Interesting. And bo- and the reason I went with those two is obviously both of them were being handled by Alderac at the time and technically used the same roll and keep system. Um, mm-hmm. But e- but even with that, I'm sh- I'm sure that there's that there are some particularities with Esper Genesis as compared to Five E. So how so? How do you how do you balance that to make sure that if somebody is using both rule sets for this adventure, that they don't get they don't get overwhelmed or they have to do a whole lot of book jumping? Uh, well, we the, the, that's actually the reason why we did the hey you can use both sets of rules as your as your third option really, and that's only if you're familiar with both. If you're familiar with D and D and you're familiar with Esper Genesis, then then you you kind of already know how to how to mix and match stuff and, and and not and not really be overwhelmed. If you are if you're familiar with one or familiar with the other, uh, we the 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 plan is to actually provide a bunch of uh, just supplement like a, a little supplement PDF mm-hmm. and like a like a some inst- you know instructions in the back and to provide pre gen characters so that if you're playing one side or the other with one game. You can easily just plug this stuff in and play the adventure series from from beginning to end, regardless of which rule set you're using. Mm-hmm. Now, with that with that in mind, 
Now, when it comes to when it comes to the adventure series that th that this is going, this is a question that I end up asking a lot of times with adventures. How high how high are we shooting for? Are we shooting for levels one through ten? Are we going with the whole shebang and going all the going all the way to twenty, or in the words of Spinal Tap, all the way to eleven? Um, what what's the level range that you're sh that you're shooting for, or don't or do you not have one in mind? I do. We're we're planning on doing all four all four tiers, all four level tiers. It's it's going to be like a uh, you know three hundred three hundred twenty plus page book. That's that's kind of like our starting point. Mm -hmm. And since since you're do since you're doing all since you're doing all four all four tiers. I'm guessing that you're that you're um separating it in that tier in that tier structure almost like each tier is its own act. Yes. Yeah, that's uh obviously the there's going to be you, you can't really do <laughs> a, a level 1 to 20 in one book without having, you know, certain milestones dropped in there, so there will definitely be those. I mean, you could, it would uh, just but... it would just be it would, it, but I'm pretty, I'm pretty it, sure any, a... edit, any editor would yeah. rather shoot themselves in the face with buckshot than try exactly. to edit that amount of uh, stuff in one go. Exactly, it'll be like you know, it would be like 800 pages, and I, I don't know, it, it would be a nightmare. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> so, sorry, rock salt. So yeah, that's not, not the that's not the plan. Yeah, yeah, rock um, salt. I got it. It's bad. It's bad enough. It's bad enough that uh, that I had to. I had I had to read I had to read through and ba and balance um all a lot of a lot of the page work in the hero system once upon a time, um for for a uh, campaign when I was doing hero system fifth edition. Which, hero um, system, I do remember that. Which um games like here games like hero system and ga and games like Rollmaster are, are why whenever whenever someone says that D and D is too complicated, I can't help but laugh because I've. <laughs> I yep. have seen. I have seen what I have seen. The abyss. <laughs> and the abyss. Oh, I, I I don't know. I, I can. I'm 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 not sure. Probably. Yeah. I, you do. You do have the hero system and role master. I. You know. I will say that. That that is. Um. Crazy. Well, th those are those I, are easy ones I could bring up. The other one that I that I bring up as my the other two that I bring up as my personal whipping boys, and I've said I will. I refuse to DM either of these unless I am sufficiently paid. Is um the original um Alien RPG, not the one by Free League. That one's good, but the original mm -hmm. one that was made in the '90s that was using the rule set of um, Phoenix Command. The other one, which has been my whipping boy for 20 years, is anything from the Palladium system. Oh, well, okay. It, Palladium Palladium can can be really easy or really hard depending on depending on what you put in it but if you're just like me you put everything in it which made it really really hard uh <laughs> so, well so yeah I, yeah I, I i agree i pick on, on the i pick on the palladium system because i am um, i am a vi i'm a massive stickler for organization and navigation i'm i'm the type of person who will who will ro who will roast certain <laughs> Certain book, certain bookmakers, if their P if their PDF is of a certain size and doesn't have bookmarks. Fair enough. <laughs> and so you must have been you must have loved the Rifts books. Well, when we're talking about the Savage Worlds version, yeah, but, <laughs> but yeah, the original Palladium ones. No, I, I, I would, I had, I had frequent, I had. But the the combination of that and the the fact that there's not an index and that the table of contents is full of lies, um, that is, that is what got that is what got riffs on my proverbial shit list. I love this. I love the setting. I love this. I love the setting to be sure. But yeah. trying but trying to run that thing and tr or trying to run Robotech or Palladium Fantasy or God help me Heroes Unlimited, which is the worst of them. <laughs> no. If I'm doing that, I expect yeah. to be paid. I expect to be paid for, um, for for. I expect to be appropriately compensated for um, hazard pay. I'll put it that way. Wow. Oh. Yeah, tell me how you really feel. <laughs> uh, I I I can add I can add to your list. Uh, it's it's actually a game system that was out very briefly, maybe a couple of years, 
And it was probably one of the most complicated uh, gaming systems I ever played, and that was Dangerous Journeys. I'm old enough to to I have had a the, the the new the new Dangerous Journeys books, and I it have, took us three days to make characters. I have played through one session of Dangerous Journeys, largely because I lost a bet, and that was enough for me to say I'm never doing this again. Yeah. Um, oh, simply, yeah. simply because, simply because of the fact that just out of spite, I had I had to org I had to organize everything that I needed in the in these little spreadsheets, which I shouldn't have done. I should have just thrown my hands and said fuck it. But unfor but you know how it is with pride. <laughs> yeah, you gotta at least get through character creation. If you don't do that, then yeah. Um, some people have asked me why why. Why I cut? Why a lot of the games that I review are relatively newer? That's because with a, when it comes to a lot of older games, especially in the '90s, there was there was some people had a massive boner for crunchiness. Mm -hmm. you know, how many how many rules and how many charts can we fit in this book? Was the mindset? Um, except except White Wolf. Except White Wolf. You have to give them props. They kind of stuck to their guns. White Wolf, White Wolf is a special case, so they're so, and they are they are very much the exception. But Fantasy Games Unlimited was a repeat offender when it came to this kind of thing. <laughs> a lot, a lot of their games, I, I will, not, I will not run. But getting getting to getting back to things. Um, mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to, now, when it comes to. When it comes to this whole, when it comes to this whole four tier thing, and this is something that I'm considering dedicating a entire episode of the podcast to, um, there's been there's been a narrative over the past few years that no that nobody that nobody plays D and D past um te past tenth level, for instance, or no nobody plays all the way up into the teens. Um, in your opinion, in your opinion, what what do you th what do you think that narrative um developed and I'm mainly asking because you're going through levels 1 through 20 on this on this project uh, I don't think it's true I, I, I think I mean it, it could be true but it's not because there's anything wrong with levels 11 through 20 uh, a lot of D&D's popularity is uh, other than other than actual play is through organized play and um, a lot of you know most organ most of the organized play campaigns. If if you're if you're not playing Adventures League, you're using the hardcovers. Like, oh, but most most of the official adventure content that comes out for Five E is levels one through ten or levels one through eleven. So once you're done with it, then it's really up to the you know the dungeon master who could easily pick up just the next book and you start over. Mm -hmm. And that, that's that's really what it is. I, I think I think the reason why tier three to through four isn't uh, isn't as popular is just because there's just not as much content for it. Uh, it's it's just as fun to play. You do have to play it a little bit differently, but I, I don't I don't see anything wrong with it. Mm -hmm. uh, you, we're we're doing the same thing when we're doing our our tier one through four in the book. Is we uh, we're also putting in not guidelines exactly, more more tips and tricks. Once you get higher level. It, you know the games start becoming a little more story centric rather than um, rather than combat crunch. Mm -hmm. So we're making sure that gets incorporated. Yeah, and with that with that in mind, speaking speaking of that, I would like to talk about the um, the character options that are going to be pre that are going to be present now. When it comes to when it comes to that, are, are we talking more, are we talking things like more more subclasses, feats, and the like to, be, to support what's present in Five E and Esper Genesis? Mm -hmm. We're gonna have uh, we're gonna have new subclasses for both um, for both fantasy and sci fi, and we are we're introducing what. Um, we we start we, we call them in, in the Master Destruction Sky, we call them origin templates. Mm -hmm. But we're we're expanding on them. It's 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 like a it's like an expansion to backgrounds. Mm -hmm. Uh where you have a template on you have a template on your character, 
based off of you know either either your um, your place of origin or um, you know or planet of origin depending on <laughs> depending on which rule system you're using. Uh, and it gives you the ability to, or it gives you options that you can take and replace kind of like another, another plug and play, you know, um, replace areas of your, of your species or even your, you know, your, your background or your lifestyle. So that way you can, uh, you can tailor it. And depending on how it gets tailored, those give you uh, abilities that you can, that you can use or, or, you know, replace for your subclass. So, like, when you reach a certain level, because you have this origin template, where you, you where you normally get one ability for your subclass, then you would you would have the option of getting uh, get something different instead that's more attuned to the setting or more attuned to the character. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> now, obviously, going through going through all going through all of them would take t- would take too long. So, I'd like I'd like you to. Uh, could you give me a few examples on some of these subclasses that are that are going to be present? Um, sure. I I I'm, I I don't really want to. I'm trying not to ruin anything. To be perfectly honest, uh, I I don't I don't want to give uh, any surprises away. Mm-hmm. One I, I I could name a couple of subclasses. Uh, one 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 subclass is uh is a um uh, like a like a marshal. Uh, type character that 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 actually uh, and and some of the, some of the subclasses are also going to be uh, subclasses that you can use for uh, two different classes, you know, for, because because of the similarities that carry. So, like the marshal, for example, can be used with the fantasy fighter or the sci-fi warrior. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's the chronomancer. I don't really need to give any clues away for that. One. <laughs> There are uh, there are subclasses that uh, there there are two specific subclasses that are that are campaign driven, mm-hmm. uh, but you can you know you can use them after even even after the campaign is over and you know they're uh, they're more focused on uh, like for example if you're a fantasy character they're more focused on studying um, you know what what what's magitech I'm sure you've heard that word before oh yeah. <laughs> So that that sort of cross, you know, fantasy side, where that that sort of like you know, technology is magic kind of thing. That's that's uh, there are a couple of subclasses that are devoted to that, and a couple of backgrounds devoted. Yeah, now I'm, I'm guessing I'm guessing that um, within 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 each entry, how it's written is this is that it's specifically for it, when it comes to both feats and otherwise, that's specifically for five years, specifically for um, Esper Genesis. Um, no, most most of the things that we're coming out with, we're going to try and make it so that it's it's easy to use for both. Mm-hmm. Oh. So we we don't yeah we don't we don't want to write two different versions of an adventure. So um, we we do have actually a, a, a few new feats that are coming out, but those can be taken by any character from either system. All right. Now, when it comes to when it comes when it comes to set when it comes to the the use of the use of weaponry, um, this is this is where there's a bit of an elephant in the room that has to be ad- that has to be addressed, and that is um in, that is introducing fu- that is introducing firearms to to some to something that does to something that um doesn't support firearms. Mm-hmm. Um, so ha- and some in some cases there's been there's been the there's been the fact that fi- that firearms um end up uh, end up outstrip end up outstripping melee and or martial characters, but given what you given what you're shooting for, um how do you make sure that somebody using a gu- using a gun isn't going to be outclassing somebody who's using a sword? Well, uh, when we had created the the eg. Uh, core manual rules. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, even even before then, when I was actually just creating the the, the sci-fi weapons armor that Asper Genesis became, uh, it was weapons and armor. Um, I I had I was looking at this and I realized that everybody that wants to make like you know 
sci-fi guns and laser guns and you know uh, uh you know my bullets do more damage and i'm like you know there's armor that stops this stuff <laughs> we we have it in the modern day like you know we like there are actual what with with the uh with advances in weaponry come advances in defenses mm-hmm. so when i started putting uh the rules together uh in astrogenesis i kept everything at like the same uh level kind of uh kind of so you could match it up with weapons and armor uh can uh, you know the swords and, and and plate mail mm-hmm. you know for example out of, out of a out of a player's handbook and the difference is you know if you are not wearing um upgraded armor or advanced armor that's actually built to stop this weaponry yes then the guns are actually going to start doing more damage to you mm-hmm. Uh, but if you find a you know shield device, or if you you know or if you're wearing you know a a suit of of, uh, of trooper armor or something, then that person shooting the gun is going to do the same thing as the person swinging the sword at the person you know the guy with uh, leather armor. <laughs> that's that's kind of that's that's how that's how we wanted to balance it out. That uh, that yes, you know weapons are more advanced. But they're only more advanced because you do not have advanced defenses. Mm-hmm. Now, when it comes to now, um, when it comes to the when it comes to the campaign setting itself, the veiled realms. Um, mm-hmm. When it are are you are you guys writing that out as a bit as a bit of a gazetteer? Uh no, no, it's gonna be more. It's going to be closer to how it's been done in, uh, I, I guess, more more modern adventure releases. A lot of companies, what they'll do is they'll put their setting in the middle of the adventure. That's that's more of what the that's more of how the veil rolls be. Mm-hmm. Uh, with with every area that the that the characters decide to visit or explore, there's going to be a lot of lore. There's going to be current events, you know, which opens up opportunities for side quests and different adventures and all of this stuff is going to have um you know uh sidebars and footnotes and things that that gms can use to continue running a campaign with after the adventure's over Mm -hmm. and even with even with the the setup of the setup of the event of the adventure having having a starting and end an end point um would it be correct of me to assume that there are that there are a handful of of side of side objectives each way through? Mm-hmm. Yep, there are there are quite a few actually. <laughs> this this is also how you do a tier one through four. You yeah. open up a lot of side quests. Yeah, yeah. There's there's go, there's going to be a lot of a lot of uh, non uh, main story focused questing that that we're we're going to make sure. That's uh, in the book. That's connected to the Veiled Realms and the Aldor system, and you know we we, we want to introduce as much uh, story lore and and options as possible, so that after after the adventure's over, uh, you know a, a GM can go well. You know what? I can I can just continue to run here. I can start a whole campaign from first level here, or I can just continue on with well, actually those characters will be pretty high. But mm-hmm. you know what I mean. <laughs> so. Yeah. Now, when it, given given that, and given that the given the whole multiple ending multiple um, endings possibility, um, mm-hmm. in order in order to in in order to um, in order to track in order to track it so that the, so that it's so that the events don't get don't get too confusing, especially with. With so with so many moving parts, um, do you have do you have a means like say if like say a float like say a simplified flowchart when it com- when it comes to the, when it comes to the different acts to help ha- to help GMs keep tr- keep track of everything? Yes, absolutely. Uh, probably the best example without me trying to describe it because describing it would be really wordy and it probably wouldn't make much sense anyway. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but we we are using a, a system that 
it, it, it's almost it's almost like a point system, like uh, uh, that tallies or you know or, or that or that adds or subtracts depending on the actions of the players. Probably the best example I could give, if anybody has bought it, seen it, or owned it, I incorporated a simpler version of it in Lost City of Mesro, which was one of uh, my uh, my DM's Guild Adepts um, adventure. That was uh, it was it was sort of like an attachment to Tomb of Annihilation, and I had that whole uh, destiny point system in it. That had a chart in the back that the that the DM could keep track of, depending on the choices that the characters made. Mm-hmm. So, not that I'm trying to sell anything, I'm just <laughs> it's like the only example that I could give. Yeah. Now, one one of the other things that I'm curious about is this is the idea of legacy items and bonds. Um, what's mm-hmm. that? What's that all about? So. Uh, in Esper Genesis, we revamped uh, the, the the magic item system because magic items are, are not sci-fi friendly. <laughs> so uh, we had converted uh, the system into into gear customization, and we introduced mods that you can add to special gear. Uh, but for weapons and armor, uh, we had put a system in place called uh, uh, core forged items. And what those items are, are special items that you keep with you throughout your character career that you can you know, choose to upgrade with, um, with, with special modifications as you go up in level. So that way there is no, you know, I, I found a plus two sword, I'm gonna throw away my plus one sword. No, that's not how it works. <laughs> your your uh, your equipment is going to improve with you as you go on, and to reverse that and bring that into a, a fantasy world, we did the same thing except for they you know they are now legacy items. They're they're items that you carry with you that grow with you mm-hmm. uh, in 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 a manner in a manner of your choosing as you raise in level. That's uh, that's the basic concept. Yeah, I can get I can get that. Um. Now I, I will ad- I will admit when I saw when when I saw when I saw how how the how the adventure is going to be structured, I ended up having this idea that you're see that you're seeing it from one of two perspectives, um, the i.e. the fantasy end or the SF end, and what I'm curious about is whether is whether or not any in testing there was the experiment to try and try and have two ca- try and have two casts. Um, working simultaneously. Uh, yeah, actually, that's um. Oh, you mean you mean two different tables of players? I mean, I mean one. I mean one cast of PCs and then another cast of PCs. Yeah, actually, that's that is how the um. That's actually how the adventure begins. Mm-hmm. It actually it actually begins from two fronts. You are you are a cast of of fantasy PCs and you are a cast of sci-fi PCs. The story starts from two different sides, mm-hmm. and and there are you know pregens provided for anyone that doesn't have the rules to play either or, and uh, eventually you know you you have you have the choice of playing both or you have the choice of just playing one side. You know either way it still goes through the same. Uh, you know, you, you, you go through a little less unless you decide to play both sides of it, but they both end up at the same point. Mm-hmm. And then at that point, you can decide the actual uh, formation of, of the continuing party. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we, we also, you know, gave... Uh, well, we, we actually haven't done that yet. It, it, hasn't, it hasn't been written out. Uh, but the idea is since you have these multiple sets of characters from either side and the way the story works depending on your choices those characters might not even entirely trust each other <laughs> or, or they or they might be working against each other so uh i i'm introducing some options to where you can you know you can switch characters out yes the characters will level the same way but you know you can i'm taking this person on this mission this time or i'm taking this person on that mission yeah 
So that way the uh, the the entirety can be experienced. Yeah, I'm I'm just a, I'm just a fan of the of the cast of characters like design, which I I blame solely on playing Ars Magica. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh. My mine is mine is is many different versions. I I actually, if I were to pick two games where the whole cast of characters thing works for me, it's Final Fantasy VI and Fantasy Star Two. Well, yeah, there's cer- there's certainly th- there's certainly that, but I was <laughs> I was mostly referring. I didn't want to I didn't want to bring video games into into that party management. Oh, okay, okay, too easy. Yeah, yeah, that that was that was, that was the you know kind of the. That sort of inspiration, right? Where where I can I can go and change my party whenever I want. <laughs> yeah. And to be fair, to be fair, since you mentioned par- um, party members not trusting each other, I'm always reminded of how one of the one of the most common um, twists that I pull in the whole you've no- you of you've known each other for years is having having the player characters be member be members of of some of some well respected elite organization. But they are the misfits, the outcasts, the the people who the people who may be able to get things done, but tend to but tend to cause but tend to not believe in the idea of collateral damage in the process. Ah, so players. <laughs> <laughs> well, if if I were to use if, if I were to use a video game equivalent, I'd use the teaser trailer for Overstrike, the game that would later become the disappointment that was Fuse. Where you had, ah, okay. you had members of you had members of this this elite covert ops organization, but they are not but they're not exactly the most functional. In fact they're quite right. in fact they're quite dysfunctional. Um <laughs> part part of it part of it is that uh, is you can you can easily you can easily make some role playing comedy out of it. The other thing is the player characters are gonna fuck things up no matter what I do, so I may as well lean into it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know that you know the players aren't going to respect anything that that's going on around them. That's just how players are. Well, there's there's a, there my table already has an unwritten rule. There are two unwritten rules that that that, ha- that happen at the table. One, if you are shot from a high angle, you will fall to your death. Bullets may do you in, but gravity will not be will not be denied. It's the blood that it demands. It's it's the it's the Star Wars rule. You have the high ground. <laughs> yeah. And two, if the party is on an if the party is on an airship, a flying vehicle, or any or anything above or any vehicle in motion or above ground, it will crash. Awesome. <laughs> I want to play it. <laughs> Sometimes, sometimes it doesn't have to be a vehicle. Sometimes it can be a tower. Okay. Because I wanted to do the whole fighting on top of the tower, and then everybody notices, why is this tower slanted? Yeah, yeah. Because you know, someone, someone's already someone's already pulled the cord. It's, it's going over. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, there's already the trope of load bearing villains of when you kill the big bad, the base ex- the base explodes. So instead of trying to fight against that trope. I always say lean into it. Tropes are never the enemy. No, tropes are <laughs> tropes are always fun, especially when you know players force them to happen. Yeah, or to, or sometimes the dice force them to happen because the dice gods are a pure model of equality, in my opinion. Because it does not mm. matter does not matter your race, ethnicity, height, weight, social class, orientation. The dice gods hate you. Okay, that's fair. <laughs> um, RN Jesus does not save, and no, I am tot- I am totally not still traumatized from rent from random number generation screwing me over in XCOM. Oh, uh, look, ninety eight percent chance to hit, still miss. Exactly. But with the, but getting back to saner matters. Saner with saner with finger quotes. Um, <laughs> what are you shooting for as a total page count? I think you hinted at a at a range, but putting aside stretch goals, what what are you hi- what are you hitting at? As for, what are you aiming for as far as the base? Some somewhere over three hundred. We're not quite sure how much because we have not hit all of our stretch goals yet. So I can't really I can't really give you a, an accurate gauge. Just yeah, that's the. But I, it's going to be a lot. 
Yeah, I, f I figured. I figured. It, I figured. Um, an accurate gauge wouldn't be. Wouldn't be. Wouldn't be applicable because let's say you give me a number and then the stretch goals end up making it go over that number and then we're both let we're both caught with our pants down about that. Well, I mean, the I I do I can say this. You know, I I'd rather I'd rather be be wrong and be able to give people more than you know that be wrong and give you less. Mm -hmm. So. I can get I can get that. So with so with that in mind, um, I do want to give my congrats for managing to get for managing to do so do so well with it so far. Since at the time of this recording, you guys are at thirty two point three thousand with twenty one days to go. Yeah, I'm really excited about that. We uh, we had funded uh, uh, in in the middle of the third day. Mm -hmm. Four or three days was up. Yeah. And with with that in, with that in mind, what are you shooting for as far as a release window? Are you thinking Q are you thinking like Q2 2022? Yeah. Yeah, some somewhere um uh midsummer. I I mean mid, uh late spring I said, around May is is the is the planned release for well, we, we want to do uh, April to May for all the digital products, and we know that it's probably going to take us an average of three to four weeks to get proofed and, you know, to get all, all the print stuff done. So after that, um, late May, early June, we'll be able to get print stuff out to, uh, to backers mm -hmm. and to retailers. We also have... Uh, we have a retail tier where if uh, retailers uh, back that they get it when the backers get it and they're able to sell it for 30 days before we give it to anyone else. Mm -hmm. And with, and I'll certainly be looking forward to seeing how, to seeing how it, how it plays out as well as what sort of insanity people end, people end up coming up with or how or how they're going to break it because it's not a matter of if it's a matter of when oh yeah i'm excited to see what people do with it um, <laughs> no matter no matter what i'm pretty sure my gm is 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 going to be is going to be yelling at me because i know i'm going to be playing a um a palerer just to mess with him because that's what a i what palerer multi class sorcerer paladin oh a power. Ah, they're overrated. <laughs> I, I say I, that as. <laughs> well, he was already. Gonna... He was. He was already right, mad at me because because I did a ranger warlock build just so I just so I could one hide in darkness and two, um, screw screw over people's screw over monsters' dark vision. Yeah. Well, my monsters have infravision. So, <laughs> well, obviously, you obvi yeah, obviously, and I'm pr I'm pretty sure with enough practice, I'd probably I'd probably find some sort some sort of workaround. But I um, <laughs> I've I've always been I've always been that person who finds new and interesting ways to troll the GM when I'm on, when I'm a, when I'm a player, or troll the players when I'm a GM. Because I believe in equality. Yeah, it's, it's, it's almost like your job. <laughs> well, I think the. The best part, the best part is, the best part is that, um, is that I don't have to do anything, and my players are already paranoid. So, I'm doing my job. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you're doing it right. Mm -hmm. But with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. It is my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. This was a lot of fun. Yep. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. And, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present... My name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>